chromosome, and we're just cutting it. And we're taking the material from the first parent that's to the left of the cut that goes to the, to the child, to the offspring, and the material from the second parent that's to the right of the cut, and then that goes to the offspring. And you can make multiple cuts. It doesn't have to be just one. Um, and so you're mixing the material from both parents to create a hybrid offspring. And so that's depicted over on the right. We've got the yellow guy with no spots combined with the, uh, the beige guy with the brown spots, and we end up with a, a yellow one with brown spots, say. So in some sense, you're mixing and matching the features, and that'll create a new individual. And so you're going to use... Uh, these operations, mutation and crossover, and other algorithms have, have different ones. Um, there's grafting, and there, there are a bunch of others. And uh, you're going to create a whole new population, usually the same size as the original, um, a whole new population of individuals that were bred from the first. Uh, but the key is that you're not just choosing parents at random from the old population. You have to choose parents in such a way that the ones that had higher fitness are more likely to get chosen. And so a really extreme example would be you, uh, you throw away the worst half of the population and only use the top, say if it's 100 individuals, only use the top 50 as parents. Um, but there are other ways. As long as statistically and probabilistically, the individuals that have higher fitness are more likely to be chosen as parents, uh, then you've got the right recipe for an evolutionary algorithm. So if we go to the next slide, slide 13, um, these operations are going to be a little bit different in genetic programming. Um, and so what we'll look at here is how crossover is done in genetic programming. Right? Genetic programming is, the genetic material is trees, it's not, the, it's not these linear chromosomes, so you can't just do this simple cut and take everything on the left versus take everything on the right. And so the way that crossover is often done, there are variations on this, but the way that it's often done in genetic programming is that you choose two parents. So here they are on the left and on the right. And you choose a node, any node from their tree, completely at random. And so the parent on the left here, we've chosen the node that has the, the little forward slash, which is the division symbol. And when we choose that node, we automatically, everything below it, everything attached to it downward, uh, gets selected as well. And then that's called the subtree. And then on the right, parent two, we've happened to chosen happened to have chosen the uh, minus symbol and it's got a little y on the left and an x on the right and so all you do is simply uh, take the subtree from parent number two and swap it with the subtree from parent number one and so if you look at the offspring here at the bottom in the middle you can see that it's basically a copy of parent number one except that the selected tree in parent number one the select subtree is replaced with the one that was selected from parent number two and this is the crossover operation that is most commonly used in, in genetic programming. You simply swap subtrees and create a new individual. Uh, this tends to be uh, a fairly drastic operation. Um, as you can see, the equations look quite different from each other. You've got the x times 1 plus x minus y over y on the left, and you've got this other equation on the right, and the result of the crossover in this particular example looks fairly different. Uh, nevertheless, you still have this tendency for for little good bits of tree uh, to accumulate in the population and shuffle around using the crossover and, and uh, now and then get put into fortuitous organizations and fortuitous configurations. And so despite the fact that this is a fairly drastic operation, uh, in practice it tends to work. Uh, and because crossover is so drastic in genetic programming, they often simply ignore mutation. And so if you look at a genetic programming um, approach to a problem, they'll often just have no mutation at all because crossover is already almost like a form of mutation. It's already a, there are these drastic changes being churned up when the subtrees are swapped. So if we go to the next slide, um, now we have an overview of, of the algorithms. And, and they all roughly follow this pattern with, with plenty of variations, but they all roughly follow the pattern. Step one was to come up with some sort of a way to encode your problem and to come up with a data structure, some way, of, some way of writing out the genetic material for your solution. The second step was coming up with a way of measuring the quality of the solution. The third step was generating that initial population. The fourth step was evaluating the fitness of every individual. The fifth step was using these sorts of uh, reproduction operations, mutation, crossover, or, or any others that you can come up with to create a whole new population. And then all you do is you go back to the second last step 
and then the last two steps they simply repeat in a loop um, and that's each loop there is called a generation again we still steal the terms from biology and uh, so in a nutshell I mean this is this is evolutionary computing this is the algorithms this is how they work um, those last two steps simply repeat you make a generation evaluate them the best of them tend to become parents for the next generation they all get evaluated repeat 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 uh, and over time, um, you have a, a general upward trend in fitness. So you get better and better solutions. It doesn't always work, but it, it works often enough and well enough um, that this is a fairly useful paradigm as a problem-solving technique. And so if you watch the population over generations, you'll see that the fitness improves and improves and improves. So if you go to the next slide, um, I will give you just a... Um, a few small examples of, I guess, what you'd call successes in evolutionary computing. So in recent years, especially, there have been a number of, of successes in evolutionary computing where um, these sorts of evolutionary paradigm problem-solving techniques have come up with solutions that are as good or better um, than the best that humans have ever been able to come up with. And so in, in, in these cases, and I'll just mention a couple of them, you've got uh, human-level human level intelligence coming out of these things. So the first example is uh, NASA's Space Technology 5 mission satellite, um, an antenna on their particular satellite called the X-band antenna. The design of this antenna uh, was produced by an evolutionary algorithm as opposed to human designers sitting down and coming up with an antenna design. And it turned out that this particular antenna had better performance, less development time, uh, and in fact consumed less power than a conventionally designed counterpart. So this is one of the successes for evolutionary computing. If we go to the next slide, another example is uh, RoboCup, which is kind of an interesting thing to look up if you want to uh, go to hop on Google when you get home. RoboCup is a simulated soccer tournament. Uh, and if you go to their website, you'll see that their goal is uh, by the year 2050, they want to develop a team of fully autonomous humanoid robots uh, that can win against the Human World Soccer Championship team. So that's a pretty lofty goal, but they've given themselves until 2050 to do it, and at the moment they have simulated matches. And the idea is you submit some sort of an AI algorithm to play soccer. And uh, in RoboCup 98, there was a team that used genetic programming uh, called Darwin United, uh, and they managed to place uh, right in the middle of a field of 36 different submissions. And so they came, they came 17th out of 36. Which is pretty good. That means that you're doing about as good as the human-designed algorithms for playing RoboCup. So next slide. Another example is uh, in the design of lenses. This particular example came from a paper that actually listed six different lenses that were evolved using genetic programming. So in this case, it's a wide-field telescopic lens. Um, and so this is from John Koza, um, Al Sakrin and Jones, 2005. And this particular configuration of lenses surpassed the performance of a, a, uh, of a lens that had been designed and patented in 2000. And so here we have genetic programming um, producing results that are either patent infringements or patentable. And this has become actually fairly routine for John Koza uh, and genetic programming. So if we go to the next slide, now we'll get into the example that I've, that I've come to show you tonight. And that is the evolution of 3D virtual creatures. And so this all traces back um, to work that I'm sure some of you have probably seen. This is this is the work of Carl Sims, uh, who's from Thinking Machines Corporation. And back in 1994, he used uh, a CM5 connection machine supercomputer, which is basically a massively parallel computer with many, many little, little computers inside it, to run a physics simulation using evolution to evolve uh, the bodies and the brains of creatures simultaneously that live in this artificial world. And these videos really uh, had quite an impact, uh, and I'd say they still do today. Um, they became real icons within artificial life, and they left a pretty strong impression on people, uh, researchers and laymen alike. So uh, 